Good afternoon, everybody. I am Jack McCarthy. I'm the president of the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History. We are the ones that sponsor uh, the Northeast Philadelphia History Fair. We do it biennially, which I always have trouble pronouncing, uh, every other year. So um, we'll do it again, hopefully, in 2026. But thanks for coming out. Uh, in addition to having dozens of local historical organizations and historic sites and historians and authors, you know, in addition to them all presenting, we have formal presentations. Um, and we had one earlier this morning on Northeast Village, and then we're having this one today on Chestnut, uh, this afternoon on Chestnut Glen. Um, these are being recorded, and we're going to put them on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to the Northeast Philadelphia History Network YouTube channel, all our presentations are there. We also do monthly meetings the first Wednesday of every month where we have local history presentations. So all our presentations are available online. And at the end of the talk, uh, so that your questions get recorded. I'm going to walk around with the microphone and hand you the microphone and any questions or comments you have, you have to talk into the mic so that they get recorded on the recording. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce my wife, Hattie O'Connor McCarthy, who has been working on this project uh, for months and months. Uh, and as I know from firsthand, once she gets interested in a topic, it becomes basically an obsession uh, and she leaves no stone stone unturned and every research avenue and angle is pursued at length. And um, so this all started, um, well, I'll, I guess I'll let you tell the story, but I'll tell you how we came to publish the book. The book was published in 1970 by Frances Richardson. You're going to hear about her. Uh, she died three years later. She didn't have any, she never married or had children. Uh, and then the book went out of print and the book is just a a gold mine of in information. So one of our board members, Fred Moore, uh, heard about it through people at Byberry Meeting and through Helen Stopper, the daughter of a uh, of a longtime Northeast Philadelphia historian. And so Fred got his interest got peaked, and he sort of tracked down this book. And then we went um, about having it reprinted. We had to get approvals from a number of people. Some of them are here today. Bob Richardson is the grand nephew. Yeah. Right, grand nephew of Francis Richardson. Uh, uh, <laughs> he so his grandfather. The book was. Are you going to talk about all this? Or? Yeah. Oh, all right. Sorry, I, <laughs> I'm stealing back thunder. Okay, I'm going to shut up now. And uh, <laughs> uh, but it's many thanks to Bob uh, and also to Byberry Meeting who partnered with us in publishing this book. So I'm going to hand it over to Patty, and then at the end I'll pass the microphone around for for questions. Before I start, it was actually Mike down the end there that found the book in Byberry Friends Library and passed that information along. And because of that, we have this presentation today. <clears throat> so. Okay. I'm off to a good start. All right, you're pushing okay. the wrong button. Push the down button. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, that's it. Just don't point it at that point. Okay. Yeah. Hark Back with the Love is a book written by Frances Richardson. She was 84 years old when she wrote the book about her life in Byberry. It tells the story of an area familiar to all of us, yet not a place that we would recognize today. Her home was called Chestnut Glen. It was rustic, but Francis made it and the property it was on sound magical. In this presentation, we will learn about the Richardson family of Byberry and those who came before them, starting with her great, great, great grandfather, Francis Richardson. In colonial society, silver demonstrated taste, refinement, and civilization. Colonists did not have titles. If they lived in the Northeast area of the country, and if they were landed, they were probably farmers, not gentry. Owning silver plate was a sign of success and importance in society. A skilled silver, silversmith, excuse the pun, 
was worth his weight in gold. Francis Richardson, that's with an I, was born in 1681 in New York. Early in his life, his family moved to Philadelphia. Francis became a merchant and silversmith. He married Elizabeth Groden, daughter of Joseph Groden, founder of Ben Salem, Bucks County. His home is now a museum operated by the Ben Salem Historical Society. Francis created pieces that are shown here that are in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Henry Richardson DuPont Winter Term Museum, and private collections. The most notable pieces crafted by Francis were shoe buckles made for William Penn's daughter, Letitia. The transaction for this sale was noted in Penn's account book. Francis was successful and a good provider for his family. He started a dynasty of talented, respected, and successful silversmiths. Francis and Elizabeth had 11 children, eight sons and three daughters. Six of their sons and one daughter died within their first year of life. Their two surviving sons, Francis Jr. called Frank and Joseph also became silversmiths. Frank, like his father, was a merchant. Joseph was a full-time silversmith. Frank made very nice pieces but wasn't as prolific as his brother, Joseph. And down on the right there, that's a maker's mark. All silversmiths put their mark on, uh, on the bottom of their works. Frank also made clocks. <clears throat> Francis uh, Frank Richardson did not plan to make silversmithing his life's work. His father must have realized that. When Francis Sr. died, he left Frank land and money. This enabled Frank to back his business as a merchant and build a large house in Chester. When he retired from silversmithing, he began clock making while still working as a merchant. His brother Joseph engraved the clock faces. And I'm ahead of myself. And this clock here is one of the earliest clocks in Philadelphia. Joseph was a risk taker. His risks usually paid off. In 1733, Joseph purchased property on Front Street from his uncle Lawrence Gruden for his shop and home. He took profits from his silversmithing and purchased many more properties and then rented them and took the rents to buy more properties. During his tenure as a silversmith, tea and coffee services were must have items for the socially prominent who entertained at teas and dinners. The more serving pieces you owned, the more impressed your guests were. There were many pieces to be had, teapots, sugar dishes, milk pots, waiters, spoons, tea tongues, and slop bowls. That sounds pleasant, doesn't it? Um, sugar dishes are, are sugar bowls today, and the milk pots are uh, creamers. Waiters are trays. The tea tongues scooped the tea leaves from the bottom of a cup when you were finished drinking it, and the slop bowls is where you put the tea leaves. Um, these, some of these here are parts of uh, tea services. The tea pot and the sugar bowl or sugar dish were part of a match set. And this teapot is on a stand. If you'll notice the, um, the finials on the teapot and the sugar bowl are pineapples. Pineapples were the international symbol, and still is, the international symbol for hospitality. And uh, not too many people could afford a pineapple. So a lot of your pieces, if they had pineapples, showed that you were trying to be a good host or hostess. 
<clears throat> also during Joseph's time as a silversmith, silver jewelry and silver trim on practical items became popular. Some samples of these items were lockets, chatelaine chains, rings, cufflinks, and silver-headed canes and whips, which uh, locket to the right, cane to the left, and cufflinks in the middle. Also during Joseph's time, uh, no, wrong. Joseph's talent brought him success, and his success brought him prosperity. This prosperity allowed him to be generous to causes that meant a lot to him. One of these causes was the friendly association of regaining and preserving peace with the Indians by Pacific measures, also known as the Friendly Association. He made thousands of items that the Friendly Association gave to the Native Americans, such as armbands, ear bobs, rings, and gorgets. These silver items were buried with their owners. Therefore, extant examples of them are few and far between. This gorget or neck decoration by Richardson is engraved with William Penn sitting under a tree, handing a peace pipe to a Native American. Being a practicing Quaker, making items to promote peace with the Native Americans was in line with his faith. Also, as a man of peace, he did not make instruments of war, such as swords. He also did not make items to be used in ceremonies of other faiths, such as chalices. By 1777, Joseph Sr. was ready to retire. His two sons, Joseph Jr., 25, and Nathaniel, 23, took over the business established by their grandfather 75 years earlier, making it the oldest silversmith business in continuous operation in Philadelphia. They operated under the name of Joseph and Nathaniel Richardson and worked in their father's shop on Front Street. It was a difficult time to be a silversmith since America was at war with England. Many of the products used in their business were imported from England and there was no trade during the war. In 1791, after 14 years of partnership with his brother, Nathaniel left the business. He entered the hardware business with a man named Isaac Paxton. And these are some of the items that the two brothers made together. Joseph Jr. continued as a silversmith in his father's shop. He bought out Nathaniel's share of the business. The business had survived the revolution and now had to face another crisis, and this one hit closer to home. The 1793 yellow fever epidemic negatively affected business, but more importantly, the disease claimed the life of Richardson's nine-year-old son, Joseph. And that's a picture of um, Joseph Jr., In 1795, President George Washington appointed Joseph Jr. as a sayer for the U.S. Mint. Richardson was the second man to hold the position. The first, Albion Cox, had died suddenly. An assayer verifies the weight and purity of silver and gold to determine the value of coins. Richardson continued to work as a silversmith while working at the Mint. He was the assayer until he died in 1831. His son, John, had worked with him at the Mint during the last 10 years of Joseph's life. John became the third assayer of the Mint upon his father's death. He only served one year from 1831 to 1832 because he did not care for the work. He then became a book dealer, an occupation that he held until he died in 1866. Thus ended over 100 years of Richardson's as silversmiths. And that's the original mint building, built in 1792. Oh, you can barely see this, but. Joseph Richardson Jr. and his wife, Ruth Hoskins Richardson, were the parents of eight children, four sons and four daughters. 
As mentioned earlier, their son Joseph died from yellow fever in 1793. <clears throat> son John died in his first year. They named their next son John also. It was he who became the third assayer of the U.S. Mint. Their youngest son was named Nathaniel. <clears throat> Nathaniel married Fiber native Hannah Yarnell. Hannah was the only child of Dr. Peter Yarnell, Peter Yarnell and Hannah Haynes Thornton Yarnell. Nathaniel, Nathaniel and Hannah married in 1816 and raised their children on a large estate in Byberry. Um, Hannah Yarnell Richardson's mother had purchased the 34-acre property from Daniel and Rachel Knight in 1806 with the plan of passing it down to their daughter, um, her daughter rather, and grandchildren. The property was called Chestnut Glen due to all the sweet chestnuts on the property. Chestnut Glen was located on the east side of Academy Road. St. Martha's Catholic Church and School are located today on part of Chestnut Glen's land. And this is a map, you can barely see it, but it shows on the top line straight across is Academy Road. On the left is Red Lion Road, which the property went all the way down to originally. The kind of curvy line is uh, the creek and um, the line on the bottom is just the straight across property line. Nathaniel Sr., top left, was the patriarch of the Byberry branch of the Richardson family. He was a gentleman farmer and also the family genealogist. He charted a family tree and in 1860, he chronicled his memories of family members. Hannah had given birth to 12 children, but one died within his first year of life. And that's Hannah, top right. The oldest child, Mary, was married to Thomas Jewett, husband, a druggist and creator of husband's calcined magnesia. Mary, Thomas, and their five children lived at 241 South 8th Street. Husband's drugstore was at the corner of 3rd and Spruce. So this is Mary, uh, bottom left, and Thomas, you can barely make out that picture, sorry. <clears throat> uh, the husbands uh, also had a summer home on the west side of Academy Road, opposite Chestnut Glen. The second child, Joseph, died in infancy. There are no photos of him. The third child was another daughter, Rebecca. Unfortunately, at the age of 26, she was declared by the courts to be a lunatic, which was the phrase they used then. Since she was not living at home after that, she was probably committed to the Asylum for the Relief of Persons Deprived of the Use of Their Reason, later renamed the Frankfurt Asylum for the Insane, and then renamed again Friends Hospital. Friends Hospital was the first mental hospital in the United States. It was founded by Quakers. Since all of the Richardsons were birthright members of the Religious Society of Friends, it is logical that this was where Rebecca spent the last two thirds of her life. There are no known photos of Rebecca. Next in line was Ruth Anna, who never married and lived at Chestnut Glen for all of her 80 years. There are also no photos of Ruth Anna. The next sibling, also named Joseph, lived his whole life at Chestnut Glen. He never worked and died at the young age of 26. And that's Joseph bottom right. <clears throat> and I might be missing the page. Okay. I'm missing a page. Uh, the top left is um, Hannah. She uh, lived, her, she never married either, lived her whole uh, life at Chestnut Glen. The next 
is Sarah Ann, or Sally, as she was always called. She also didn't marry. And um, the next is John Thornton. Uh, his mother had previously been married to a Thornton. So that's where he got his middle name. He lived across the street on the west side of Academy, sort of directly across from where Archbishop Ryan is now. The next is Maria Bispham. She had scarlet fever as a child and was completely deaf. Uh, although she read lips very well, but Francis writes in the book that a lot of times they would speak to her, but they would not, you know, enunciate. Nothing would come out of their mouths because she could read their lips so well. And they figured she couldn't hear them anyway. So they got good at doing that. And she was very good at listening. She took under her wing uh, one of the younger of the children, the orphans, as they were called, uh, James Nevins. And she took care of him until she died, basically. The next is Nathaniel. And he lived on the other side, the Richardson House, Chestnut Glen, was actually two homes. One was built in the 1700s, one was built in the 1800s. He lived on one side. He had owned the property where Archbishop Ryan is now, had a very large farm. In, 17, in 1877, the sisters invited him to live in the other half of the house. So he sold the farm and moved him and his family into the other side of the house. So there were basically two families living in one house. They were connected on each floor by a doorway, but they kept, they, they acted like it was two separate homes. And this is um, Nathaniel's wife, Barry Kane Cooper. Dr. Elliot Richardson was the baby of the family. Elliot graduated from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He specialized in obstetrics and gynecology with a special concentration in operative obstetrics. In the 1860s and 70s, if delivery by cesarean section was necessary, odds were either the mother, child, or both would die. Elliot's skill as a surgeon resulted in a majority of successful deliveries of babies and saving the mother's life as well. In 1876, Elliot married Atcha Willis Nevins. They set up house at 737 Spruce Street near Pennsylvania Hospital where Elliot worked. While living at this house, their first four children, Hannah Yarnell, Catherine Nevins, called Katie, Elliot Jr., called Buddy, and James Nevins were born. They soon moved into a more fashionable neighborhood to 1829 Spruce Street, where baby Francis, the author of our book, was born. They were a happy, loving, upscale family looking forward to living the American dream. However, we all know that dreams don't always come true and shattered dreams can change lives forever. Following exposure in the hospital, Dr. Elliot Richardson died from typhoid fever on May 9, 1887. He left a widow and five young children, ages 10, nine, six, four, and one. After her husband's death, Atchsaw had to sell the house on Spruce Street and she moved her children to 3302 Haverford Avenue in West Philadelphia. Atchsaw had trouble coping with the loss of her beloved husband. She worked too hard, ate too little, and was very run down. In 1888, she caught whooping cough and was too weak to take care of herself, much less five children. Her mother came to help tend to her sick daughter and help with children. Atchsaw spent most of her time in bed. 
most of the care of baby Francis fell to Katie, only 11 years old, who was completely overwhelmed. Hatchsaw was sent to Colorado Springs by her doctor, hopefully for a cure. This makes me question the whooping cough diagnosis because A, adults rarely got it. B, if an adult did get it, it usually only lasted seven to 10 days. And C, patients were usually sent to Colorado for treatment of tuberculosis, not whooping cough. Regardless of what disease she suffered from, eight months after arriving in Colorado, Adjsa died on December 20th, 1889, leaving five orphans, a word often used to describe them. The orphans were taken to Chestnut Glen, their father's childhood home, to be raised by his four elder unmarried sisters who still lived there. The house was actually two houses that were connected. The building of one was started in 1700. The other was built in 1806. They were accessible to each other through doorways on each floor. Both were owned by the aunties but one side was rented by their brother, Nathaniel, and his family. And the four sisters were always referred to as the aunties. And this is a picture of Chestnut Glen taken in 1965. And uh, you can't really tell from this picture, uh, but the, the, it was, the house was set way off Academy Road, very deep in so that you couldn't even see from Academy Road, you couldn't even see the house uh, between the distance and all the trees. Um, but that's basically what it looked like. Initially, Hannah and Katie boarded at Abington Friends Boarding School and were only home during the summer. Elliot, or Buddy as he was called, went to Byberry Friends School. James went with Buddy the year later. Francis had no playmates during the school year. And frankly, when Hannah and Katie were home, they were playing together and didn't want to play with a baby. The boys didn't want to play with a girl, although Buddy let her tag along with him. This solitude resulted in the development of a great love of nature in Francis. She learned the names of all the flowers, many still common today. This is a picture of the, from the, I'm sorry, from the rear of the house. On the left is James Nevins. Then next is his father, Nathaniel. Then Hannah, Sally, Maria, and Nathan the younger Nathaniel's uh, wife, Mary, and with her baby in the carriage. <clears throat> uh, so she learned the names of all the flowers, many still common today, such as chrysanthemums, roses, and daisies. In the summer, the backyard was a carpet of flowers whose names we don't hear much today, such as ampelos, Pelopisus, Cinquefoil, Spring Beauty, and Star of Bethlehem. Going top. top. <clears throat> Besides the obvious presence of chestnut trees on the property, there were maple, walnut, mulberry, willow, hemlocks, beech trees, and a cucumber tree. A cucumber tree is actually a magnolia tree. Near the cucumber tree was a pedestal with a sundial on it. The front, on the left, you can see a white pedestal, small. The sundial was made by Joseph Richardson Silversmith in 1816. In the rear of the spring was the spring house. On the second floor of the spring house was a smoke house with blackened walls. This building was from the 1700s. Apparently, the aunties did not use the smokehouse. And this is a picture of the sundial, which was in the backyard for over 100 years. 
before its value was discovered and it was donated to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Birds of all kinds filled the sky, the trees, and the chimneys. Of course, there were sparrows and morning doves, but there were so many others that we don't see today, such as chimney swifts, which top left and then to the right, uh, flickers, wood peewees, and oven birds. Um, I know that the chimney, um, chimney swifts, they would build their nest in the chimneys, and there were six chimneys at Chestnut Glen. Besides the abundance of wildflowers and cultivated flowers at Chestnut Glen, there was a variety of edible items growing on the property. This arbor had grapevines growing on it, and in season there were strawberries, blackberries, mulberries, various vegetables, and hops to make yeast for bread products. On the opposite side of Comley Road, on the same side of Academy as Chestnut Glen, Uncle Nathaniel owned property that had apple and cherry orchards. The orphans and their cousins would pick the fruits and vegetables when they were ripe. Despite claims of shortage of money in the household, there was plenty of money to buy the best foods and plenty of it. The aunties ordered specialty imported items from E.J. Crippen and Company and Baxendines such as biscuits or cookies, as we call them, orange marmalade and boxes of rusks, which were only to be eaten by Aunt Ruthanna. These were, the rusks were like Zwieback toasts that are given to teething babies or like a biscotti, although I don't think it came in the flavors that biscotti comes in. These items came from England. Raisins and oranges came from Spain, Chocolate from France, Switzerland, and English Quaker companies such as Cadbury, Browntree, and Fry. They also ordered large bags of Java coffee, beans, and oolong tea. Ordinary food items were purchased from Irvin's store, post office, social hall, and apartments in Somerton. It was located on the southeast corner of Bustleton Avenue and Byberry Road. This multi-purpose building was owned by William E. Irvin. The social hall was the first meeting place for the Harry A. Hausman Masonic Lodge, number 717. It met there from 1922 to 1930. Coincidentally, James Nevins Richardson, one of the orphans, served as secretary of the lodge from 1922 to 19. 59. James lived on Trevose Road in Somerton from 1922 to sometime between 1950 and 1964. Okay, this isn't a very good map, but you can see the circles. Another source of food for the Richardson was their neighbors. Eldridge Tomlinson, who lived next door where Archbishop Ryan is today, uh, which was land that had been Nathaniel Richardson's. And William Parry, who lived on Red Lion Road, raised pigs on their farms. So the top is Eldridge Tomlinson, and you can see above that, it's hard to make out, but that says Ruthanna Richardson uh, and others. And then William Parry is down on the bottom there. In the fall, Tomlinson would slaughter his pigs, and in the winter, Parry would slaughter his. So twice a year, the Annies would order fresh killed pork roast, chops, sausage, and scrapple. All other meat was provided by the butcher, who came three times a week in the summer and twice a week in the winter. They purchased turkeys, chickens, lambs, and eggs from various neighbors. They also purchased milk from neighbors when their cows were not producing enough. Additional fruits and vegetables came from the huckster. <clears throat> and these are four of the five orphans. James to the left, Katie, the tall one, Francis, our author, and then Buddy or Elliot. 
and that they're at the Great Barber there. Another picture, there was, there, there's no pictures that we could find that had all five of the children together. So this one is missing James, but Hannah is in it. And so it's Katie, Elliot, Hannah, and Francis in the front. Hannah was going through a stage where she wanted to be a boy. So she wanted her hair cut very short, which no little girls then had. They they had their hair long and preferably curled, but obviously they all had straight hair, so they couldn't have the curls. Unless the weather was really bad or it was dark, the orphans could be found out of doors. The aunties took naps in the afternoon and wanted the house quiet, so outdoor play was mandatory then. The children loved being outside. Hannah and Katie loved climbing trees. The boys loved swimming, fishing, or catching salamanders, snakes, or turtles in the creek behind the house. And Francis was happy to join in any of the activities. However, it was usually only Buddy who welcomed her company. To the children, the different kinds of outdoor activities seemed endless. On rainy days, they occupied themselves by playing in the barn. They loved playing with the cats and the endless litters of kittens that lived there. They also loved playing in the hay mow or hay loft. I think I might be out of order. No? Okay. Speaking of the barn, it should be mentioned that it was not a place for just for fun and games. The horses had to be curried and the, milk, uh, the cows milked and all of the animals needed to be fed. These chores were Buddy's responsibility. Hannah and Katie were very strong-willed and refused to do things that were not to their liking. After several years, they did calm down and become uh, well-mannered young ladies, but initially they were not. Their behavior was sometimes an embarrassment to their aunts. James was very high strung and nervous as a child. He would often run and hide when called upon to do something. Of course, for many years, Francis was considered too young to be of much help. Buddy, however, never complained and carried more of, than his fair share of the load. He helped tend the gardens and pick fruits and vegetables when they were ready. He helped his uncle harvest the hay crop. Every Saturday, he carried buckets of water into the house and up the stairs for Saturday night baths. On Sunday evenings, he carried buckets of water up to the back porch so that it was ready to do Monday morning's laundry. He rolled heavy barrels of chemicals up and down ramps for making the magnesia. He loved Chestnut Glen as much as Francis did. Any way that he could be of help, he was willing to do so. When he went away to school, he was very homesick. In the bitter cold weather and in the evenings, the children played games in the little parlor. Many are names familiar to all of us, checkers, parcheesi, Chinese checkers, and old maid. There were also so many other games that were before my time, but they kept the children busy. They often popped corn in the fireplace and roasted chestnuts from their trees in the hot ashes that lay in the bottom of it. They were all avid readers, the aunties read many books, newspapers, and magazines that they had delivered. Aunt Hannah, Uncle uh, John liked to discuss politics, so they read uh, that they read about. Aunt Sally read every day to Frances when she was too young to go to school and taught her to recite poetry. So the rocking chair right there was Aunt Ruth Anna's. Nobody sat there but Aunt Ruth Anna and in front of the fireplace where she kept warm. Even in the summer months, she had a shawl around her. She was cold. As you can see in the next room, which I'm assuming, but I don't know, is the big parlor, since this is the little parlor. And you can see against the back wall there, a bookcase full of books. They had many, many books in the house. 
and you can see drawings on the walls that were done by Aunt Sally. I spoke earlier about Aunt Mary's spouse, Thomas Jewett husband. He and her father, um, Aunt Mary's father, had invented husband's calcine magnesia. This was a laxative and remedy for stomach ailments. The orphan's grandfather had built a laboratory in 1844 at the rear of the property for making the magnesia. Uncle Nathaniel and Uncle John became manufacturing chemists and worked daily in the laboratory. When grandfather died and the Annies got um, the house, they got the laboratory too. Uncle Thomas paid the aunties $600 a year to rent the laboratory, which was a fortune back then. He paid the uncles to make the magnesia. The laboratory was one place on the property that the children were not permitted to play. Aunt Mary had died in 1874, and although the orphans were close to Uncle Thomas and his children, they had never met Aunt Mary. A sample of the magnesia can be found in the American History Museum at the Smithsonian. On the wrapper to the left there, it states, it has received first premium silver medals from the Franklin Institute, the American Institute in New York, the Massachusetts Mechanic Association, and from the Maryland Institute. It also won a New York World's Fair medal. So this, if you want to pass this around, please don't drop it. This is a sample of what these little bottles up here that the Husband's calcine magnesia came in. This was a water wheel in the back of the property. These are um, Uncle Nathaniel's two daughters, Bessie and Anna, sitting there. And the, the water wheel's dark. I hope you can see it. It's to the left there, and they're sitting. <clears throat> Upon graduation from, uh, all right, I must, okay. These are classmates from Abington Friends Boarding School. Katie is at the top, the third one from the left, and Hannah is at the bottom, the one to the right. In 1892, Francis was finally old enough to attend school. Buddy was now at Abington Friends with Hannah and Katie. Therefore, James and Francis walked to Byberry Friends School together. Francis states in her book that it was two miles each way to school, but it's really just a little over a mile. However, to a six-year-old, especially in bad weather, it must have seemed like much more. Francis loved school. In addition to learning, she finally had friends to play with. In 1893, the George School, a Quaker boarding school, opened in Bucks County near Newtown. Uncle Nathaniel served on the George School Committee from the school's opening until his death. In the fall of 1894, he arranged for Hannah Katie and Buddy to enroll in and board at the school. Upon completing Byberry Friends School, James went to George School also. Upon graduation from Byberry Friends School, Frances attended Friends Central School at 15th and Ray Streets. It took her three hours each way to get to school and then to get home. She had to walk from Chestnut Glen to the Red Lion Terminal, which was near the um, Red Lion Inn. Then uh, she got on at Frankfurt Avenue. She had to take three trolleys and then walk two blocks to get to school. 
She could not socialize after school because the aunties had errands for her to run in town after school and wanted her home for dinner by 6 p.m. Frances came down with typhoid fever in 1902 and while still in a weakened condition, she contracted measles in 1903. Since she was now unable to walk to school, she was enrolled at the George School where she could board. So she didn't understand why her brothers and sisters got to go to the George School, but she had to walk down to uh, and take buses I and mean, trolleys and <clears throat> Buddy entered Swarthmore College in 1898 and graduated in 1902. James and Francis both entered Swarthmore in 1904. James graduated in 1907 and Francis graduated in 1908. And this is what Swarthmore looked like then. I mean, now it's a huge campus with very modern buildings and a very beautiful campus. Since the orphans are adults at this point, the person most responsible for nurturing both their bodies and minds should be pointed out. This person was Aunt Sally. All of the Annies graduated from Friends Central School, but only Aunt Sally took her education further. She studied at the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts and was quite a skilled artist. Here are some examples of her work. That's a sketch, presumably, of, at Chestnut Glen. Different sketches and a painting. She also made beautiful wax flowers and could barely keep up with the orders that she received. But her drawing, painting, flower creations, all were given up when the orphans came to live at Chestnut Glen. Her life then became, became devoted to the children and making a good home for them. She taught James and Francis how to read. She read aloud to all of them. She taught them how to play games. She taught them about nature. She cared for them when they were sick and even quarantined herself with Buddy and Francis when they had scarlet fever. She did all of the cooking, preserving, bread making, and baking in the home. She also made the household soap. She took the children on trips to the Academy of Natural Sciences, the Academy of Fine Arts, Memorial and Horticultural Hall, at Fairmount Park and at Fairmount Park and Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. She took them to the U.S. Mint and told them about their great grandfather, Joseph Richardson, the second assayer of the Mint, and they were taken to see his portrait. She also took each of the children, with the exception of Francis, when they were old enough to Washington, D.C. Sally looked for unusual ways to expose the children to the wonder around them. For example, in 1900, there was a solar eclipse here, just as we experienced last week. She tried to smoke glass with a lantern so that children could look at it. They tried, but the sun hurt their eyes. So then she took them out to the porch where the sun appeared as a circle on the back porch floor as it shone through the trees. They watched as the circle became covered by the shadow created by the moon. I thought that that was clever. Who knows how the lives of the Richardson children would have turned out if their parents had not died when they were so young. But rest assured, these orphans were blessed to have Aunt Sally. Getting back to the orphans. Hannah didn't wish to continue her education after graduating from George School. She was in love with Edward Gaskell, whom she had met at a young age at Abington Friends. They married at Chestnut Glen in 1901. They had four children, two sons and two daughters. 
They lived in West Virginia early in their marriage and in North Carolina for most of their marriage. However, Edward divorced Hannah in Reno, Nevada in 1934 to marry another woman in North Carolina 11 days later. It is unknown if Hannah just believed until death do us part or if she didn't want her Philadelphia family and friends to know that Edwin had divorced her, but her obituary calls her the widow of Edwin Gaskell. <clears throat> Hannah, I'm sorry, Katie always loved drawing and painting. Aunt Sally always encouraged her as she had been an artist herself. With the aid of Aunt Sally and Kate Bradford, sister of Katie's mother, Katie was able to enter the class of the famous author, illustrator, and teacher, Howard Pyle, who was teaching at the Drexel Institute. Do you have that? She met Eugenie Wireman while studying at Drexel, and they became roommates. Katie began freelancing in 1900, and that same year gained a contract with Curtis Publishing Company. She illustrated some articles for Curtis's Ladies' Home Journal. In 1905, she married Eugenie, or Jenny as she was called, his brother, Henry Wireman. They moved to Virginia for a few years, where she had the first, of, first two of her three daughters, Mary and Catherine Virginia, always called Virginia, to distinguish her from her mother. She was able to work from home and drew illustrations for Ladies Home Journal and Good Housekeeping. They moved to, back to Philadelphia where she had her third daughter, Henrietta. She often used her daughters as her models. They settled in a home at 6111 McCallum Street in Germantown. Did you? Oh, okay. Oh, we're passing around now uh, one of the illustrations that um, Katie did when she, it's for ivory soap, I believe. It was then that her career really took off. She became a book illustrator, a magazine cover versus magazine article illustrator, and the illustrator for national advertising companies such as Procter & Gamble, advertising for Ivory Soup. Her husband died in 1931 at the age of 54. Katie died in her McCallum Street home in 1966 at the age of 87. And these are some of her covers also. I'm sorry, this is all. <laughs> but Elliot Richardson, her buddy, was the first college graduate in the Richardson family. He graduated from Swarthmore College in 1902 with a Bachelor of Science degree and an advanced degree in civil engineering in 1905. Elliot married Ida Dorothy Strode, at Westchester Monthly Meeting in 1915. They had two children, Jane and Elliot. Elliot worked for years at Midville Steel and then Keystone Gypsum Fireproofing Corporation. He was borough secretary of Swarthmore Borough from 1935 until he retired in 1961. Elliot also started to write his reminiscences some of it was handwritten, some of it was typed. He probably started his memoirs before Francis started hers. Elliot's grandson, Bob, <laughs> donated these reminiscences to Swarthmore Historical Library at Swarthmore College, along with other family items to preserve his grandfather's memory. According to his wishes, uh, upon his death, Elliot's body was donated to science. And this is 
like some of his reminiscences when it started. That's a picture from the newspaper from his obituary. <clears throat> James Nev Nevins Richardson married Estelle or Stella Bowman in 1918 at Ashbourne Presbyterian Church in Elkins Park. They had one daughter, Ruth Ann Richardson Sutton. He was a chemist at DuPont Dye Works in Carneys Point, Salem County, New Jersey, until 1922. He was then employed as a chemist for the city of Philadelphia until his retirement. He lived in the Somerton neighborhood on Trevose Road, but moved to Wyomissing, Pennsylvania sometime between 1951 and 1964. He passed away in Wyomissing in 1971. James and Stella's only daughter was living in Wyomissing at the time of his death. Frances Richardson never married. Much of her life was spent alone, but she was never lonely. She taught at Byberry Friends School. She was a trustee and overseer at Byberry Friends Monthly Meeting. She served on the Corporation of the American Friends Service Committee and on Friends Peace Committee. She loved to paint and draw. She studied history, birds, and flowers affections that she had since childhood. Another of her childhood passions were cats and kittens, as seen here with an armful of kittens at the age of 10. She was starved for friendship when she was young, but once she went to school, she made lifelong friends. She is second from the left in this photo. Celebrating the 150th anniversary of Byberry Friends Meeting House, Frances dressed for the celebration in her great-grandmother, Hannah Yarnell's dress, bonnet, and shawl. And that's a picture outside the uh, meeting house. In 1970, Frances's book, Heart Back with Love, was published by Dorrance and Company of Philadelphia. To celebrate the book's publication, a tea was held at the House of Colonial Dames on Latimer Street by the Honorable and Mrs. Thomas J. Curtin. Mr. Curtin was the U.S. referee in bankruptcy, and Mrs. Curtin was the former Virginia Wireman, Francis's sister Katie's daughter. Virginia was a world-renowned silversmith like her ancestors. One of her works, a silver cigarette box, is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Again, bad photo, but Francis was a first time author. This is Virginia uh, Curtin, Wireman Curtin on the left. And that's Francis on the day that they celebrated the publication of her book. Francis was a first time author at the age of 84. She said at the time that she would like to write another book. Unfortunately, that was not to be. Frances died three years later at Germantown Hospital. She had been living at Stapley Hall at, on Washington Lane and Green Street in Germantown. Like her brother, Elliot, Frances donated her body to science. Her childhood was often hard and people were sometimes cruel, but Frances always tried to see the beauty and was forgiving. Hark Back with Love is both a lovely and sad story and I recommend it to everybody. That's, that's the end. I just want to say before I take any questions that um, I told before the book happened, you know, at the beginning about the Richardson Silversmiths and after the book only went up to her graduating from Swarthmore. So, uh, I tried to do parts that weren't in the book because I really, really recommend that everyone buy the book. It is a great, great story. Oh, so, yeah. Nance has them. In the There's a one's in the back right here if you want to buy them right here. So uh, does they're anyone fifteen dollars? Uh, they're going to be twenty dollars, uh, but we're selling them at a special price at the fair today for fifteen dollars. So um, 
anyway, yeah, the, the, this is an amazing story. And again, many thanks to to Bob uh, Richardson. Uh, he he's the grandson of Francis's brother. And of course, Francis didn't have any children and didn't have any heirs. We needed somebody to give the family blessing. And since his grandfather, the book was dedicated to uh, his grandfather, uh, he gave the family approval. And thanks again to Mike at uh, at Byberry Friends for helping to set the whole process in motion. So anybody have any questions, comments? Yes, yes. sir, hold on. John, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I'm curious about the house on the west side of Academy Road. Yes. Is that the same structure that was there when Ryan was built? You know, I think so. I think it, it looked old. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and um, Uncle Thomas' husband's house, I believe, is where the uh, firehouse oh, okay. is now. And you saw the mystery for me. I uh, eat apples out of a, an abandoned apple orchard on Academy <laughs> Road. And now I know where they came from. <laughs> um, later on, that property of uh, Uncle Nathaniel's uh, became, I don't know whether anyone has ever heard of it, Hiawatha Day Camp. And thats that was Uncle Nathaniel's property. Any other questions? Oh, there's the box. Okay. So uh, this gentleman here actually lived in Chuck Glenn. You want to talk about your memories a little? Uh, uh, my name is Ken Swain. Uh, Swain family um, were from Northeast Village. And when Northeast Village was torn down in 62, we were displaced and we had nowhere to go. Uh, and, and I believe a member of the Richardson family uh, decided to rent the house out, the two parts of the house out, to people from Northeast Village who had nowhere to go. When we, st we, were there, we lived there for about three years. Uh, it's my earliest memories as a child is running around on that property and playing and uh, all the fathers hunting in the, on the property and uh, it, it, it's, it was weird as way I, I came the last week I was planning on coming for the Northeast Village presentation and somebody posted something on Northeast Village about did anybody ever work with uh, ever live uh, know anything about Chestnut Glen and my brother in California responded yes we live there and then somebody else responded back to him yes we lived on the other side and he says did your father have four fingers and the name bud and, and he, he's now in contact with, their, with that family also but um i my mother was always uh trying to do you know history history of this and this book was actually at the library friends meeting house and she checked it out back in 1970 and that's how she learned about the history of the property but it was a, it was a beautiful property even then, yeah. you know. And after we moved out, I believe that's when they uh, took to it there. Anybody else? Any other questions, but comments? If I, I can just um, say again, there there are so many really touching stories in this book that um, unless you read it, you really can't appreciate. Um, some were funny. Uh, Francis told the story of after uh, Chestnut Glen was sold, a bunch of kids came. She went to visit up there. A bunch of kids came with a, a turtle, and it was all in its shell. And when she took it from them, she said it came out of its shell. And she said, and it looked like it recognized me. And I, and I recognized it, and I turned it over. And it had my brother James's initials and the year 1897 carved into the shell. Now, uh, that sounds a little fishy, maybe. But but also, uh, unfortunately, had, uh, Francis, I guess being the youngest or, you know, she couldn't stand up for herself, was treated really cruelly at times. It, it would just break your heart. Things that were said to her, things that were done to her. And um, although she tried to be very positive and told a really great story, um, you know, maybe it was the times uh, people treated children differently or whatever, but you really, you, you just, you got to read this book. I'm just telling you, you got to read it. it. It's just great. It's just great. And 
it's really kind of heartbreakingly sad in spots is what Pat said. Oh. All right, thanks everybody for coming. Enjoy the rest of the history fair um, and go buy the book. <laughs> Thank you.